Hello, I'm Diana Deason. <laughs> I have nothing to disclose. Um, so just an overview of my talk. I'm going to talk about malrotation. What is it in case you haven't treated it since uh, you were on a ped surgery service as a resident? Um, and what a LADS procedure is, what procedure we do surgically to, uh, to uh, decrease the risk of volvulus. Then I'll talk about what kind of problems these children who or these adults can have if they had a procedure, had a LADS procedure as a child. And then what do you do if you diagnose malrotation in an adult? Do you fix it? Do you not fix it? Uh, I'll then touch on gastroschisis and emphalocele, some abdominal wall defects, um, and what kind of problems they have once they reach adulthood. So malrotation. Brief review of embryology. So if you remember when uh, you were a six-week-old fetus, um, your intestines were actually outside of your abdominal cavity. Then over the subsequent few weeks, they elongated and rotated 270 degrees in order to have the duodenum fixed at the left upper quadrant and the cecum fixed at the right lower quadrant. The intestinal contents also then um, went back into the abdomen and ideally your abdominal uh, wall closed. If you do not have this kind of rotation, oops, if you do not have this kind of rotation, you are malrotated. So duodenum here, cecum there. Um, malrotation is also found in many other anomalies. So intestinal atresia, cardiac anomalies, uh, trisomy 21, um, anal rectal malformations, and heterotaxy. So a lot of these patients can have other anomalies as well. It's important to consider that when you're seeing a child with malrotation, or yes, a child with malrotation. Ideally, most of these would have been identified by the time uh, they present to adulthood. Now, these patients may present with acute symptoms or they may present with chronic symptoms, and we'll look at each of those individually. They also may be asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. Some authors would argue, are they really asymptomatic or are you just not asking enough questions? So in the acute presentation, biliosemesis is malrotation until proven otherwise in a pediatric patient. So um, biliosemesis is common, Ab abdominal pain, distension, um, you can have an elevation or decrease in your white count. And then as you get progressive bowel ischemia, you have symptoms of progressive bowel ischemia. So abdominal wall erythema, metabolic acidosis, sepsis, death. Now, in the chronic condition, um, these patients may are often symptomatic two to four years prior to their operation. But some patients reportedly symptomatic for eight, 16 years prior to their operation. And they're characterized by intermittent or partial obstruction. And so these patients often re report chronic abdominal pain, a crampy abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, uh, constipation, or malnutrition. So the presentation does tend to vary by age. As you'll see, children or infants, uh, there we go, infants uh, more likely present with emesis. Now this may also be because we're ha we have a hard time diagnosing abdominal pain and nausea in an infant. Um, but in the adults, most likely, Almost 90% of them have abdominal pain as their presenting symptom. Uh, nausea and uh, emesis is also very frequent. Um, now, at the time of operation, you're also more likely to have volvulus if you're less than one year of age. Um, now, the exact numbers vary by study. So some will report the, and I included one other study down here. Now, some will report that the incidence of volvulus at the time of the operation is upwards of 70%. But we can just average the two to say somewhere between 40 and 70 percent uh, of infants may present with a volvulus. In adults, the studies are somewhere around 12 percent. So 10 to 20 would include most of the studies. So the incidence of volvulus at time of operation decreases with age. But it does not approach zero. 12 percent is still a significant number. Now, this is also an important point. So resolution of symptoms after surgery. So while Children, particularly infants, tend to have resolution of their symptoms after surgery. In adults, one-third of those patients will not. So this is very important when you're counseling your patients. If you're doing a malrotation procedure on an adult, a third of them will not have resolution of their symptoms. It's important for them to understand that preoperatively so that they don't, they aren't, dis well, they still might be disappointed postoperatively, but so that you have an informed discussion. And presentation by age. So with um, infants, they're much more likely to present with just days of symptoms. For adults, if you, if you add up the months and years together, 
you'll have about 60% of the patients that'll have symptoms for a very long period of time. Now, it's a little bit difficult when you're quantifying symptoms because symptoms um, of uh, abdominal symptoms can include bloating, uh, nausea, which can be caused by other conditions as well. Malrotation, the gold standard for diagnosis, is an upper GI. So the duodenum should cross uh, across the spine to the left of the vertebral body and go up to the level of the gastric outlet duodenal bulb. And on the lateral view, you should see a retroperitoneal portion. If you do not have this, you are not normally rotated. Um, if you have a volvulus, then you're likely to see a coil spring, corkscrew, beaking. Um, I included a uh, corkscrew here. And the cecum is usually in an abnormal location. But 10 to 20% of the time, the cecum may be in a normal location. So a normal BE does not rule out malrotation. Um, and the sensitivity and specificity is highest for upper GI. CT and ultrasound can also be used to diagnose malrotation, but the sensitivity and specificity is lower, so an upper GI is usually recommended to confirm the diagnosis. On CT, you'll see a whirl-like appearance to the bowel and the mesentery, demonstrated here, and that is the bowel and the mesentery wrapping around the SMA. Again, keep in mind that the position of the cecum cannot be used to definitively say a uh, patient is not malrotated. On ultrasound, uh, you'll have an inversion of the SMA, SMV, and you can have this whirlpool sign um, as the uh, bowel and mesentery wrap around the vessels. Operatively, what we do to, uh, for malrotation is we do what's traditionally called the LADS procedure, and there are five main steps. You untwist the bowel in a counterclockwise direction usually, though it can be disorienting depending on LADS bands. You lyse the LADS bands and straighten the duodenum along the, along the right gutter. You broaden the mesentery, um, and you replace the bowel into a position of non-rotation with a small bowel on the right side and the large bowel on the left side. Though not initially in the original description, oftentimes patients will also have an appendectomy at the time of the procedure because otherwise the appendix is in an abnormal location and you can have an atypical presentation of appendicitis. So here's a picture of one of my malrotated patients. So we eviscerated the bowel. You can see the, you can see the volvulus here. So we reduced, this is a separate pa patient, um, we reduced the volvulus. We're identifying some LADS bands here. Straightening the duodenum, so you want, this can be actually kind of challenging because you've got the uh, pancreas right under this bell loop here. Um, and so you want to make it so that that duodenum goes straight down to the right lower quadrant. And then lice any abnormal LADS bands and broaden out this mesentery so the mesentery is as broad as possible. I tend to perform an appendectomy because while um, some will say you don't need to perform an appendectomy, everybody gets a CT scan anyway, um, I don't know that everyone would recognize that my patient was malrotated and that when they present with left upper quadrant pain, I don't want them to be diagnosed with reflux or uh, peptic ulcer and given a PPI. So I tend to take it out. There are certain exceptions, patients that uh, have problems and I anticipate them needing uh, uh, vesicostomy, some other procedure in which we might use the appendix. Uh, I may consider leaving the appendix in. And then placing the bowel back into the abdomen with small bowel on the right, large bowel on the left side. Unfortunately, some of these patients present with a mid-gut volvulus and can have ischemic bowel. If there's question of viability, if it's a small amount, you can remove it. Unfortunately, it's usually a large amount from the duodenum to the mid-transverse. Uh, unless it's liquefied, we want to give that bowel a chance. Um, so give it a time to pink up in the OR, keep the patient warm, um, have a low threshold for using a silo and doing a second look at 12, 24, 48 hours. This bowel actually did pink up, surprisingly. Um, you can perform a LADS procedure laparoscopically. Um, it's been described in the literature for about 15 years now. And the conversion rate's somewhat high. It's uh, up to 25% in studies. Um, and this is because broadening that mesentery can be very difficult, it can be very disorienting laparoscopically. Um, patients who have a volvulus, the conversion rate is 40 to 100%. And you can imagine unvolvulizing that bowel laparoscopically could be quite challenging. Um, so this is a summary of some of the pediatric um, uh, articles on this topic where most of the authors recommend not doing this if you suspect or identify a volvulus. Now, um, lap laparoscopy can be very helpful when the upper GI is equivocal and you're not sure whether or not they're malrotated, non-rotated, or have a normal rotation. 
And if you're able to do it laparoscopically, they tend to have a shorter time to full feeds and trend to, towards shorter length of stay. Though the question is long term, would they have a higher risk of revolvulus? We don't have the literature to know what their incidence of revolvulus would be. Um, they just haven't been followed that long. Complications, so you have the acute post-operative complications that you'd have from an abdominal operation, ileus, wound infections, antisusception, strictures. Long-term complications is where these patients tend to have more problems. And if I did a LADS procedure on a patient and you're seeing them in your ER or in your clinic 20 years later, um, the things that are the most uh, prevalent in these patients are bowel obstruction. And so you see five to 24% reported here. That's really depending on how long the follow-up was. A lot of these studies are short-term follow-ups of a few months, but if you follow these patients out for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, a lot of them, up to, up to a quarter of them, are readmitted often with a bowel obstruction, and they can have persistent issues with intestinal dysmotility, feeding difficulties, chronic abdominal symptoms, nausea, vomiting, bloating, um, and a recurrent volvulus is reported at 0.4 to 1.6%. So you're decreasing the risk of volvulus, you're not eliminating it. So, uh, so some of the things to consider in an adult patient that's had a LADS, bowel obstruction, revolvulus, although the risk is low, you must keep this in your mind because otherwise, the, the problem with the volvulus is that it's not diagnosed until later and your bowel's all ischemic. So you need to be able to diagnose this early so that you can prevent bowel ischemia. Also keep in mind, if all the colon's on the left side and all the small bowel's on the right, you can have quite a bit of difficulty with screening colonoscopies, getting that, getting that scope all the way where you need to get it done. Um, and they can have atypical presentations of appendicitis if the appendix is still in place. Now, if you identify malrotation in an adult, do you fix it? Well, the summary of the literature is there's still debate. Um, so what are the pros of fixing it? So the pros of fixing it, specifically if you have symptomatic patients, is that about 70% of patients will have improvement or resolution of their symptoms. Um, that does mean that a third have persistent symptoms. In the asymptomatic patient, the question is, one, are they really asymptomatic, or are their symptoms mild? Um, and the benefit in the asymptomatic patient would be to decrease the risk of volvulus. Now, it doesn't eliminate it, but it does decrease it. Now, what are the cons? Well, the cons are, what is the real incidence of volvulus in this adult population? It's less than it is as an infant, but what is it truly? And the hard part is, we don't really know the denominator for the number of people walking around with malrotation. Um, and then the risk of surgery. The risk of surgery for adults is quoted between 22% and 60%. 22% it was for the elective group, 60% is for the emergent group. And this includes immediate post-operative risks as well as bowel obstruction, hernia, and persistent abdominal complaints. And so it really comes down to the, um, uh, your assessment of risk, the risk of a volvulus versus the risk of the post-operative complications, and the comorbidities of your patient population. So for example, in this 22%, uh, the study noted that uh, one of their patients that had, two of their patients that had lots of complications was 83, uh, heart disease, renal failure. And so um, uh, assessing your patients, um, uh, whether or not they're at increased risk for any operation is important when discussing whether or not malrotation um, uh, surgery is appropriate. So in order to quantify this more specifically, there are some studies that have looked, like a, looked at a mathematical model trying to identify when the quality of life adjusted uh, life expectancy um, is beneficial for LADS versus deleterious for LADS. And uh, I won't go into the study in depth, but um, Malik identified 20 years of age being the tipping point where under the age of 20, the benefit of the quality of life was substantial. And after the age of 20, um, considering the risks of surgery and the life expectancy um, that would be added to one's, uh, or the number of years added to one's life, um, no longer favored a LADS procedure. Now, this is a mathematical model based on a lot of expert opinion and, and a level three and four evidence. Uh, but it's an interesting way to look at this question. Other authors would argue that um, since the risk of uh, complications is threefold in the emergent group, that everyone should have an elective LADS procedure to avoid being in this group of patients. <laughs>
So it really comes down to having a discussion with a family and the patient um, and your assessment of how, how, uh, how good of an operative candidate your patient may be. Now, patients with abdominal wall defects also have malrotation. So and when I'm talking about abdominal wall defects, I'm going to focus on gastroschisis and emphalocele. So for gastroschisis, you have an abdominal wall defect in which your intestines are outside of your abdominal wall uh, with no covering. Most of them uh, don't have associated anomalies, but 15% have either or have complicated gastroschisis with either atresia, perforation, or volvulus. Um, Phallocele does have a covering membrane, um, but unfortunately greater than 50% have concomitant anomalies, including trisomy 21, uh, cardiac anomalies, GU anomalies. When we repair these, there are a couple different ways that we can repair these. More recently, there have been descriptions of sutureless repair where we reduce the abdominal contents and then place a dressing over it, whether it be Tegaderm, um, Mepilex, Duoderm, something like that. And it's amazing that most of these, all of these will have umbilical hernias right afterwards, but by the age of five, often these umbilical hernias tend to resolve. And those that haven't can undergo an elective repair at the age of five, which is when we usually fix umbilical hernias in children. Um, you can also do a primary repair where you reduce and close. If you can't get all the bile in at once, you can place it in a silo and then gradually reduce it twice a day and then close it either primarily or sutureless. And then large defects require quite a bit of creativity and can be quite challenging, requiring painting, tissue expanders, giant and phallocele, since they already have a covering, we paint and wait until the kid gets bigger. And then uh, oftentimes can involve our plastic surgery colleagues and repairs. Component separation can also be used. And do take in mind, or keep in mind, when we talk about outcomes for these patients, the more severe the abdominal wall defect and the more concomitant anomalies, the worse their outcomes. So long-term issues. Uh, so what are their long-term issues? The biggest issue is that a third to two-thirds of patients are very self-conscious about not having an umbilicus. Um, some of these patients, up to 5% will say that this is a severe problem in their life, um, it, resulting in low self-esteem, teasing, making themselves, and 32% report that, they're, that they feel ugly because of their scar. Um, others report pain at their scar as well, and so abdominoplasty in adults with gastroschisis is actually quite common. Other surgeries that they end up needing over time is ventral hernia repairs and umbilical res revisions, as I talked about, either hernia or scar. Now, granted, we don't have very long-term follow-ups. These follow-ups are 16 years and nine years, but that still puts them in adolescence. So uh, long-term effects are still not well studied. Um, other procedures that they need, ventral hernia repairs, uh, and long-term outcomes from phalloceles in particular, tend to be more complicated. 20% of them, uh, this is a follow-up of uh, 16 years. Um, at 16-year follow-up, 20% had died. 70% uh, were readmitted, often because of their concomitant anomalies, but they also have persistent abdominal complaints, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. So in summary, for these patients, if they show up to your clinic and they had had abdominal, or they had had a gastroschisis or emphalocele repair as an infant, Keep in mind, frequent GI complaints are common, a third to a half. They are malrotated, so their appendix isn't going to be in the normal position. They could be a challenging patient to do a colonoscopy on. They are malrotated, so they do have a risk of volvulus. We don't tend to do LADS on them at the time of the procedures. And that a third of them will have repeated bowel, bowel surgeries or repeated surgeries, either for bowel obstruction, hernia, or scar revision. Uh, the plastic surgeons will often see them because of the psychological stress of having no umbilicus. Um, and overall, they tend to do well um, from their abdominal procedure, but their long-term outcomes are based on their cor comorbidities. So I'm sorry I went a little over, but I'm happy to take any questions. So you have a patient who has a history of malrotation. They've had a LADS procedure. They're in their 30s. They present with abdominal pain and bilious vomiting to our adult surgeon colleague. Um, the, the question in the mind is going to be a recurrent volvulus versus a small bowel obstruction. What imaging study do you recommend and when? Um, so, uh, so imaging study would also, uh, let's start with 
seeing and examining the patient and deciding whether or not they're hemodynamically stable. Somebody with peritonitis and bilious emesis doesn't need an imaging study and can go straight to the operating room, just like they can with any, any other adult child presenting with acute peritonitis and acute surgical abdomen. Assuming that they don't have peritonitis, um, then, uh, and most of them by the time I get a call, they've already gotten at least a KUB. Um, uh, diagnosing or separating the two um, may be done with a CT or upper GI. I think that a CT scan can give you an idea of the transition point. Um, I think that an upper GI is the most helpful if uh, your question is specifically for a recurrent volvulus. Um, but I think a CT will give you a general view of their entire abdomen. I agree. Thank you.